All right, I've got something very special today. This is Jay. He's super into mainframes, but he also knows pretty much everything there is to know on the IBM side of things. And he's actually stuffed an entire mainframe in this keyboard. This is the finest that up through about 1994 has to offer, but the deal with mainframes is they tend to be kind of long-lived, so it'll run pretty much anything from what, like 64? From 1964, when IBM first introduced OS 360. To about 1994 at native speed or better than a mainframe. Sometimes much better. And the magic is a little bit hardware and a lot software. And so we're going to dive in and we're going to talk about a lot of old stuff and a lot of new stuff and a lot of other stuff. But you've also got decades of experience on me. And our audience kind of skews older in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, let's call it, tech YouTube. And uh, I get the feeling that some of you in the audience are getting a little paranoid about being useful, you know, as you've got three, four, five, six decades <laughs> of experience. Been around computing since <laughs> uh, since the teletype was the cutting edge of user interface. Oh, it's just it's my way of saying that imposter syndrome uh, that does that never stops. It no, just, it, it doesn't. Just, it just keeps going. But you can still be productive, you know, well past you know that. Don't don't worry about that. But also, let's take a look at preservation and some of the fun stuff. And uh, you know, you get around too, like just a bit. Yes. He might look familiar. We'll explain why, but you might already know, and you've already <laughs> probably put it in the comments. But don't look at the comments and cheat. Let's talk about history and computing and all kinds of fun mm -hmm. stuff. Okay, so this is basically a mainframe and a keyboard. Yes, and that's got to be unsettling like we'll take it apart okay spoiler alert there's a raspberry pi in there but there's a lot more than just a raspberry pi in there yes but the first thing that stands out in my mind is you know you worked on some of these original systems in the 70s and it's got to be mind-blowing for you thinking about a raspberry pi and how many millions of instructions per second and how all that shakes out i mean it is the the first mainframe i worked on was a model 370 158 with an attached processor that was good for about 1.6, 370 million instructions per second. So, like, just over one and a half million instructions per second. Yes. So, like, not megahertz, just and, million instructions and, and per And that second. machine was big. It, it had six megabytes of storage. <laughs> and, and it was semiconductor RAM. The, and the interesting part of that is that the top four megabytes of that was Intel, not hmm. IBM. Wow. Huh. How many people know that Intel made mainframe memory <laughs> well who else is going to make it <laughs> that's fun and uh yeah ibm sort of has other people do stuff and then when it mm -hmm. becomes a good thing they sort of take over and you know sort of yes. bring it internal but that was what that was like 74 that 76? Th for me I, uh that machine actually hit the floor in 1981 mm -hmm. second hand so it wasn't a new machine at that point i st i first started working on it as a systems programmer in 1982. Yeah, that, well, that's another thing around mainframes is they tend to live on. Like we, you know, buying a desktop computer and a gaming graphics card is like, oh, my graphics card is three years old. It's basically <sighs> obsolete. Well, mainframes, you know, they would have a productive lifetime of 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, that, easily. That PDP 11, I know I, I got to work on some PDP stuff a little bit. And like that thing was still in actual production use in like 1995, 1996. Yes. And that also dates from 1968, so the very long-lived computers. And the when people put the kind of effort that went into the applications that ran on them, they didn't want to have to rewrite all those millions of lines of dusty old COBOL. <laughs> yeah. Well, they haven't. It's still there. You can it's still, still there. You, you can still make a darn good living as a pro COBOL programmer. <laughs> oh, it's horrifying. Please make it stop. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's um, it is one interesting aspect of that that we were kind of talking about before you know we started recording, is that everything goes in cycles. That's pretty obvious. I think everybody knows that. And it's like oh, there's a mainframe and it goes to the client PC and then it's back to mainframe whatever. But the software aspect of that, uh, for me, makes it a lot more transparent what's happening, because um, you know onto the desktop and the mainframe has to do with like where the program complexity is. And now with the cloud, when we talk about things like serverless. I think what you're talking mm -hmm. about with how much engineering went into the application, we're seeing that in applications that are engineered to be quote unquote serverless. Yes. And uh, there's also an, an emphasis in the serverless world of being tight and efficient 
and on the mainframe especially when you're dealing with just a couple of megabytes and you're trying to serve hundreds or thousands of users at once uh, program efficiency and writing tight fast code becomes really important so for the machine that like you were talking about from the 80s mm -hmm. um, even though it was you know on the order of a few MIPS mm -hmm. uh, it could potentially have hundreds of clients that that machine served about 150 users yeah that's daily uh, that's like something you know on a modern scale that would be like a raspberry pi being able to serve 150 u users yes compared to like how much horsepower you have in a modern desktop computer versus you know like a thin client or a terminal or a serial terminal exactly or like that so um it looks like the application complexity like the user interface complexity is moved all to the client but then what's running in the back end ends up being the lightweight fast but also robust and secure. Yes, and uh, security is something that uh, that people have have kind of forgotten how to do. Uh, in the mainframe world, it's something that you think about as you do as you're developing, because again, you are serving thousands of users, and so you have to pay attention to that kind of thing, less some. And, not, and it's usually not some rogue actor so much as it is somebody fat fingering a key. <laughs> yeah. uh, that they do something that brings it all down and all of a sudden you have an entire enterprise sitting there twiddling their thumbs because the mainframe's not running. <laughs> I saw a story about that the other day. There was a guy who got a call from his bank and they were really angry. And they said, did you change one of the names of your account online like because you can enter an alias for your bank account he used uh the uh, eggplant emoji as the name of his account oh my and that apparently brought down the entire banks like they could no longer bring up a list of accounts that their, their people had or anything like that that doesn't that doesn't sound great there are reasons I'm not a fan of Unicode everywhere. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought of that. But, Why oh, can't we heavens. inject Unicode into the mainframe? I don't understand. No, I'm just kidding. Uh. <laughs> yeah, fat fingering and, and then accidentally bringing down the thing. It's like, uh, yeah, it's idiot proof. Don't worry. They'll build a better idiot. No kidding. <laughs> I have a friend who, uh, who worked at Johnson Space Center for years and worked with astronauts. And he would say that... Uh, you can't make anything astronaut proof because astronauts get more ingenious every time. <laughs> I'm not even mad. This is genius what you're trying yeah. to do here, and it just doesn't even work correctly. And yeah, I could I could believe that I, I could, with some of the stuff that I've seen from from users. Yes, but I couldn't help but notice the parallels between serverless and mainframe and mm -hmm. modern stuff. And when you talk about security, you know, a lot of the architecture in the organizations that are offering programmers an interface to serverless three quarters of the initial setup is all around security it's tokens it's rate limits it's you know figuring out the billing part of that because they charge yeah. you based on usage and and you know and that's another reason that people are once again paying attention to tight fast code when you pay by the server instance minute those minutes add up in a hurry and all of a sudden there becomes a powerful economic incentive to be quick yeah yeah, a lot of websites are moving all of the, you know, the JavaScript cruft, cruft and the web assembly and all of that. All of that runs client side. And then what's happening server side is just very lightweight, very lightweight authentication, very lightweight lookups. And it's because they're getting charged for that mm -hmm. versus whatever runs client side. Yeah, the, the client side computer from, from, the, uh, from the vendor's perspective is free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's a great way to, you know, do all of your work do all of your data processing do all of your munging you know if you if you have a system that lets you upload photos you know mm -hmm. do your image optimization and resizing and everything like that client side rather than server side yes because you're paying per unit compute and if you have and millions of users that's millions of dollars and if you you know that assumes that you have nice tight fast connections between client and server yeah but these days that's pretty much a given yeah yeah, it's it, it depends on having really good connectivity everywhere. Yes. Some of that has driven, you know, if you look at it as a cycle, the lack of a good connection has driven some of that to happen client side and client side to have more trust and looser security than maybe it should because the connection prevented it from being done 
Well, I mean, you can always do a good job of security, but the connection mm-hmm. to the to the client prevented it from happening server side. Yes. But now it's more convenient to do a server side, and we have a fast connection. It's really the best of both worlds. It is. So, it's really sort of exciting. Do you see? You know, where do you see how that fits in terms of like cloud and security and scalability? versus like client side stuff. I mean, what about like preservation and and making sure everything works really well together? That's, so that's two different questions there. Um, And preservation is something that I've been been involved with from the aspect of the mainframe operating system, the mainframe software uh, for quite some time. That was really kind of what got me into Hercules in the first place. Um, And so as we do client-side computing as we do the this stuff off in the cloud um the the one saving grace there i think is that everybody's using git to do this with but those git repositories are not available Mm -hmm. so the you know preservation i don't see as being all that great well let's let's back up for a second Mm -hmm. so you know imagine a world that's serverless and it's like i've got this really amazing game and it's you know, running serverless, basically. It's hitting an API. Mm-hmm. And so I have the client code, and the game is really awesome, but I don't have the server code because nothing was ever done server-side for preservation. But mm-hmm. assuming that I could get the code that was running server-side, there's also another piece of the code that the infrastructure people had. Yes. And it's like, oh, just because I have the code doesn't mean that I also have the code to drop in the infrastructure. Yeah. You, but you Can you run AWS from 2005? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so... For the mainframe side of that, when we're talking about that in the context of mainframe, you know that introduces something that you've already done, which is Hercules, mm-hmm. which takes care. It's a it's a it's a software layer that takes care of actually running. You know, we haven't shrunk the mainframe. This mm-hmm. is software that's being the mainframe on the ARM processor in a Raspberry Pi. Yes, Hercules is an emulator for IBM mainframe systems from the very beginning all the way up to current Z series. And it runs on Windows, on Linux, and on Mac OS. And it is, it's strictly a hardware emulator. There's no software in it. You have to, it's made to run the original IBM operating systems. And so you ha- so when, when you run Hercules, you bring it up, and then you IPL, which is mainframe ease for boot. Uh, you IPL the, main, the real mainframe operating system, just like you would on a system 360, for example. Yeah. And, and run it. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with the PyDP because there's a bunch of different operating systems on its emulated disks. And when it boots up, I have to go into the boot register and set where I want to actually start executing code from. And depending on those addresses that I've memorized, I can boot it into a bunch of different operating systems effectively. And, and, and so in Hercules, that's a little easier because what you do is you set up a configuration file with emulated disks and emulated terminals and emulate everything else. And one, then what you do is you tell it what disk address to IPL. That's pretty awesome. And the uh, software part of it, you know, the thing that I think people that are watching have to keep in mind is that the software part of it um, was a little bit more Wild West, let's say, <laughs> in terms of uh, what it was. And so the preservation aspect of it is that it wasn't like IBM had you know, the one gold master <laughs> for AWS from 2005 or the equivalent of that. It was every different customer had something different. Yes. A lot of what has been preserved, I, I get the impression that it comes from academia. It does. But there's a lot of stuff from the business world that has already been lost, but a lot of interesting stuff that you found. And uh, a lot of the stuff from the business world was preserved actually by a group called Share. Share is well, Share was the first users group for computers. Period, F- founded in 1955 for IBM mainframe customers, hmm. and it's still going today. <laughs> well, they must have an amazing library of stuff. They do, although they uh, the, a lot of it's kind of frozen in time. There isn't a whole lot of point in updating an operating in updating shareware for an operating system that was last updated in 1983. Yeah, well. I was looking at, you know, some of the old sources for Unix and that, you know, like Berkeley has their own Unix and some of the others uh, Unix and there's probably parallels in the IBM mainframe world. But, you know, you mentioned Git and Git as a tool to see what customizations were made at Berkeley versus Mm. Stanford versus, you know, Duke or other places that were running, you know, Unix at the dawn of time. And it's really interesting to see 
what changes to source were made and things like Git make that easy. Yes. And so it's like IBM does have the gold masters of like this or that or the other, but you can see how it evolved when they sold mm-hmm. it at customer and customer and customer and customer because you can track that because Git's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that anybody's done that kind of work with the mainframe operating systems. Uh, they At least initially they were distributing source code. Uh, I wrote a cookbook on bringing up OS 360, which is the first of their great line of operating systems. And you actually assemble that from source, or assemble most of it from source. And that one's the one from before 1978? Yeah, that uh, originally, OS 360 was announced with the System 360 on April 15, 1964. It wasn't shipped for a couple of years after that, and there is a famous book called The Mythical Man Month that explains why. (laughs) Yeah, The Mythical Man Month is basically required reading if you manage any sort of programmers or you're any sort of project manager with with those kinds of things. It's a really, it's it's basically a seminal book on that. Yes, Um, and it was written by the guy who managed the development of, of OS 360. Yeah, it's a very, very insightful book. Uh, Also, the design of design. I really like that one as Mm -hmm. well, which is like kind of a follow-up. He did did that later. Yeah. But uh, it was basically like thinking outside the box, the book. Uh, And that that sort of brings us back to this Mm -hmm. because this is thinking outside the box in a keyboard. This is literally the mainframe inside the keyboard. So let's let's take a look. Okay. This one is easy because it only has three bolts. 5.5 5.5 millimeters standard you know standard issue yeah this is this is a standard ibm model m keyboard the 122 key version i've replaced some of the keycaps with stuff from one of the at keyboards that had uh the 3270 which is the mainframe terminal uh, keys on them i see an ethernet jack at where the old sdl jack used to be mm-hmm. so this has the raspberry pi mounted here with cutouts in the back plate for the connectors and i only really expose power and one hdmi um i have a a fan on it uh and that is enough even with the cover on to keep the raspberry pi below 65 c which it keeps it from throttling itself so this was you know we're talking about 1.5 million IOPS in, two, in 1984, 1982, mm-hmm. somewhere through mm-hmm. there. And this is what? So, yeah, this is this is 1.6 gigahertz. And on the ARM, that means 1.6, uh, 1,600 MIPS as opposed to 1.6. But how fast can you run the IBM stuff? Uh, so when I'm running Hercules on this it, and run it flat out, it pushes about 60 MIPS. Okay, so that's... Uh, that's quite a bit faster than 1.5. Yes. That And that's what I meant when I said this will get us through about 1994. Because you could buy a mainframe in 1994, and it was also about 60 minutes. And, and you would spend a whole lot of money. <laughs> millions upon millions of dollars. Yes. And now it's $35, mm-hmm. plus some love. Yeah. The, the, the keyboard actually costs more than the Raspberry <laughs> Pi. <laughs> These are nice. The nice. Oh, that buckling spring. Oh, it's so nice. Mm-hmm. And so underneath it, you can see that it's got um, the Raspberry Pi and there's the Ethernet jack. And over here is a half a terabyte solid state disk inside a little case. <laughs> oh my goodness, a half a terabyte. And on the underside of the keyboard is a custom controller I built. Uh, that's, is that, yeah, I think that's black pill. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. The STM32. That's yes. A, another ARM processor. Mm-hmm. ARM's just everywhere. And uh, this has a custom program in it, which I use to make the keys on the keyboard act like the real 3270 keys. Yeah, you were saying uh, it runs QMK, quantum mechanical keyboard, and uh, it has multiple layers. So it has a PC layer and then layer zero, which is 3270. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, so layer zero is PC and layer one is 3270. Okay. And there's really, that's really all there is to it. That You see that uh, there's, um, uh, it's just stuck down with double stick tape and little bumpers there hold it <laughs> up, ag- ho- up against the backside so when you plug connectors into it, it doesn't push it out of the way. I'm kind of, I'm actually not real happy with how the backplate turned out because 
if you look, you can see it looks kind of chewed. Uh, that's me car hand carving out with a Dremel. Well, I'm sure that we can. Uh, but it works, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could also, like, you know, make the hole much larger and then make a 3D printed IO shield for it, but mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. It's I, fine. Yeah, you know, you're, that's, not the, that's not the part of it you look at anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it is really exciting that an entire mainframe fits inside a keyboard. And I call this the 360 64 because, you know, uh, homage to the to the 360 naming convention which used two digits and i was inspired by the commodore 64 <laughs> and the raspberry pi is also 64 bit mm -hmm. so it kind of fits yes so nice all right well let's get this hooked up and let's take a deeper look at the software okay all right so what are we looking at we've booted up the keyboard how yeah. insane is that yeah well we 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 boot up a lot of things these days the one that always got me was waiting for the camera to boot so what we have here is the standard Raspberry Pi desktop. I have the Raspberry Pi OS installed on here. This is actually the beta 64-bit version. Okay. Um, because I want to be able to run 64-bit software. And it has a little bit better hardware acceleration for most things. Yes. And what we have here is, a, is an IBM marketing picture from the 1960s. <laughs> It's so it's so American. It's so red and blue. Mm-hmm. And got the raised flooring. And uh, probably about yeah. sixty-two degrees in that room. The guy sitting at at that that console is a three sixty model fifty, I believe. <laughs> With the blue keys. With the blue keys and and all the blinking lights. Uh, I love the blinking lights. That's why I bought the Pi P eleven. Unfortunately, blinking lights have gone out of fashion. I think that's a bit of a shame, but systems are running too fast enough that they wouldn't blink anyway. <laughs> They're just on all the time at varying brightness. Yes. So what we have here, now I'm going to open a terminal window. Okay, actually having two terminal windows is good. And you'll notice that I'm not that I'm using a funny font. This is the, th the IBM 3270 font that I have as a true type file. <laughs> And I will uh, change into my emulation directory. Th and this is the VM370 Community Edition. It was put together by a group of enthusiasts from the public domain VM370. And they incorporated a bunch of useful software into it. So this is the pre-1978 stuff? Yes. Okay, cool. And what I'm going to do now... Um, I'm going to bring up Hercules with the configuration file that I've already written for this. Okay. Uh, well, that they wrote for this, and I hacked up a little bit. It's so cool that you worked on Hercules and, like, helped bring it to life and, like, did the code and the program, and it's like, no, these machines must not be allowed to die. I was, I was one of the, in fact, I was the original lead maintainer for the project once it got to that point. Nice. Um... And I served in that role from 2001 till 2012. Nice. There, now it's up. Okay, and we will hit escape. And this is the Hercules control panel. This is the blinking lights. The, uh, yeah, this <laughs> is this is as close as it gets to blinking lights. <laughs> and this is some of the some of the devices that are defined to it. This is the display of the general purpose registers. This number right here is the actual number of MIPS it is executing. <laughs> it keeps count. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> but, bef but before we start VM370, I'm going to bring up a couple of terminals. And what, what this, this will be the system console for VM370. Now, this looks like those old school CRT green screens. That's but, because it is. But uh, in a terminal window. That's because it is. <laughs> okay, so... This, this is going to be the system console, and we'll bring up a couple of user terminals as well. Um, and we don't need to connect to the console group for that, so we'll get rid of that and leave the space in there. And set the font size a bit lower. There we go. Actually, I'll leave that one just like it is because it's still readable at that resolution. Um, and we'll bring up one more. And this is going to be important because I am going to eventually bring up um, bring up another operating system under the control of this one, and it will need its own console and user terminal. So what I'm doing 
Uh, the first operating system I'm going to bring up is called VM370, and VM stands for Virtual Machines. Uh, it is a it is a hypervisor just like uh, just like VMware or something of that class is for the PC. But it dates from the dawn of time. Yes, this VM370 was originally released in 1960. Well, CP67, its immediate predecessor was released in the late 1960s. Um, <laughs> and it was it had virtual and machine in its name. How yes. everything old is new again. And, and the 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 programming interface to it is the System 360 370 Principles of Operation Manual, which describes the architecture of the 370. So let's. Uh, what I'm going to do now is bring up VM, and to do that, uh, on this console, the highlighted letters uh, show what what key you need to press to it. So IPL is marked L. So I'll hit L, and it says Select Device, and VM is installed on this device here, device A at 06A1. So, there's the console. And holding means that there's more messages for it. I'm going to switch key maps on this keyboard to the 3270 key map. And now these keys act like the real 3270 keys as far as X3270 is concerned. Nice. So, it, what it wants me to do is hit clear to show the next screen. So, I'll hit the clear key. And there it is. And I can hit the clear key. Nice. Um, and so now we're going to switch over here. And right now, this is just a user terminal. I could log on to CMS, which is the inter the interactive service under VM, and do VM kinds of things. VM 370. Ah! Yes. Instead, what I'm going to do is... Hit enter. And enter key is here. This just goes to the next line on the screen. Uh, I'm going to log on. And I'm, there is a user-defined VM called MVS with the password MVS. In a real environment, you, of course, wouldn't assign that <laughs> password. Or it would be what you discover to your horror when you're helping them fix something. Yes. <laughs> so we'll log on as MVS and... What it's doing now is it is automatically, you see over here it says log on as MVS. And what it's doing now is it's automatically IPLing MVS 3.8. Oh, nice. Um, and it, it's, it's asking me to tell it what parameters, what parameter settings I want to use for this IPL. And I want to accept the default, so I'll just hit enter. And it's going to think about it. If you look over here, Oh, yeah, we're running at like 16, 19 MIPS, mm -hmm. 21 MIPS. And meanwhile, MVS is coming up. These are all messages issued during IPL. So this is actually booting a lot faster than it would have on real hardware. Yes. Uh, a real 370, this would have, this, just to get this far, would have taken several minutes. Wow. Um, and it's, it's thinking about it, and, and it, you can see the CPU indicator over here. And just it's the all, one CPU. It, just the one CPU. I, <laughs> the, um, actually, this version of MVS will run multiple processors, but this version of VM won't. Mm. So, okay, and down here it says more. So it wants me to hit clear. And then these are all messages that it is putting out during the IPL process. And it's finally gotten to the point where it can start things. And it's starting... The other, t uh, in MVS, uh, what is called a daemon in Unix is typically run as a started task. Mm. And so you see STC net, for example. That is the network uh, started task that started. Yep. Hit clear again. And it's going to complain at me about some things that it can't activate because they're not online to it. That's fine. We don't care. So we will ignore that. And it is starting up some other started tasks. Uh, the BSP pilot is started task is one that starts everything else automatically, so I have to sit here and type it. Oh, nice. And there we go. And it, it's going to complain at me some more because it, there are some, some commands in BSP pilot startup procedure that don't apply to this system, but I don't care. <laughs> 
and and that's actually fairly typical in, in a real mainframe shop there's there are going to be messages that the operating system thinks are important that nobody else does and so you just kind of ignore them as they go along it's the operating system is getting some clues that it might not really be running on a real mainframe but it's like ah, it's probably okay i'll go on yeah it, <laughs> it doesn't care okay so now now it, it this this happens to be the last thing it does during ipl so now the system's up and running and so what we can do here is i'm going to get past this fancy login screen but instead of logging in as a user i'm going to tell this session to connect to mvs as a virtual terminal and that's what the dial help us spell it right that's what the dial command does and so we will hit that and it says dial to mvs as as device zero charlie zero and i'll hit clear and we get a nice fancy login screen oh nice uh this this uh this is the turnkey for minus system uh volker Bonke of germany developed the original turnkey took it to version three this is his cat <laughs> um and a guy by the name of jürgen winkelmann in germany updated it a lot but he's not he's not saying this is a new version of the turnkey system this is an update to uh, uh, to volkers so he calls it tk4 minus we'll log on And we we'll log on to TSO as user Herco one. Okay. Yeah, once it's asking for the password, which is not Herco one. <laughs> that trips me every now and then. <laughs> and it's thinking about it. And up here, you can see Herco one started. Oh yeah, nice. These three asterisks mean TSO is going to clear the screen and show you something else, but you have to, you know, it's waiting for you to okay that. So we'll hit enter. It's crazy to me that the product or the, uh, you know, thinking about DOS and old command prompts, it was like, we're just going to keep on showing stuff on the screen. We will never pause it automatically mm. ever. And yes. the mainframe is like, I'm never going to flash something on the screen and then clear it before you have a chance to read it. Yes. And so the, the TSO logon process shows you Volker's cat again <laughs> and a fortune. Nice. And then... It's starting to feel vaguely Unix-like. Mm -hmm. And then three more asterisks. And there we have a... Uh, th this is something the turnkey system added uh, is kind of a menu selection of things you can do when you're logged in TSO. Oh, nice. So uh, there is a full screen editor. Actually, there's two of them. I'm going to use one called RFE. The, uh, there's an IBM program product called ISPF that every shop uses. Um, and I described it in a contribution I made to Eric Raymond's book on Unix system programming as a, a, a does everything program that start, it's does everything but start the machine room coffee pot. <laughs> um, and this is kind of this is the same kind of thing although it doesn't have all the capabilities ispf does but it's public domain so hmm. and i'm going to bring up a list and nope oh, i'll actually hit the tab key and i'm going to make sure that says sys1 sys1 is the high level qualifier of names for of data sets that the operating system uses and here we're actually tripping over one of the differences between hercules and real mainframe because real mainframes are built for io speed as much more than they have processor speed mm -hmm. and the raspberry pi can only do so much there but this is a list of all of the um all of the sys1 data sets that the system knows about and so if i wanted to go edit a terminal definition, sys1.vtam list. Yep, that one. I tell it edit E. And there's all the members that define things to VTAM. VTAM is the uh, is the MVS SNA equivalent of the TCP IP stack. Huh. And all of the everything that it knows about is defined in this in this data set. Cool. So this is a little more advanced than editing a file. This is actually like the system definition stuff. Yes. But it's a little less abstract than 
you know, machine code or something that would be compiled or something like that. This is actually like the uh, mechanical pieces that help the terminal run. So we will move the cursor down to that line, that line, and hit S for select, and hit enter instead of new line. And this is the definition for this. The first one here is the definition for the terminal I'm logged in for. And it's not going to make any sense to anybody who's not a VTM system programmer. <laughs> Neat. It's green text. Yeah. yeah we're hackers now. Mm -hmm. But this is the kind of thing that an IBM mainframe system programmer does all day. Is he goes and edits files like this uh, that control how the system operates. And so when you're done, you hit F3 is end and go back. And I can F3 myself all the way back out to that menu. Nice. And then if I'm done, I can F3 again, end that. And it's going to think about it and say, you know, tell me how to get back into it. And now I can say log off. And we're back to the log on screen. Unlike you know, like Linux and Unix and not so much like uh, DOS or Windows, uh, you have to pay attention to how you shut this thing down. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. And BSP Pilot to the rescue again. Um, I'm telling it that I want it to shut down now instead of waiting for five minutes for people to log off and things to terminate gracefully. We're here on standby power. I don't know if the batteries are going to hold out. You have to mm -hmm. go down now. Yes. And hit clear to... And so it, this message here says that it's no longer accepting logins to TSO. Mm -hmm. So you don't have somebody trying to log in in the middle of trying to shut the machine down. Yeah. Why did I get logged off? Let me try to log back on. And it's like, no. Yeah, no, you don't want to do that. It sent a message, but users can be stubborn sometimes. <laughs> users don't read. Now, there's one thing that I'm going to need to do over here on the operator console. Um, remember I mentioned the CMS operating system? Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually going to use it for one thing. And I, that iCMS command tells it to IPL CMS. Okay. And it's, it's waiting for me to, to give it an option. And I'm not going to. I'm just going to hit enter. I'm just going to think, okay, fine. And... Each virtual machine has a virtual card reader and a virtual card punch. <laughs> because that's... It's and, and from the era. From the era. And you can tell it to connect the card punch of one machine to the card reader of another. Oh, okay. I'm going to do that. That sounds like a serial cable. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it, it logically is. And I'm, I just told to, 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 te to send a virtual punch of this virtual machine to the virtual reader of MVS. And now I'm... And what I did was I, I told it to send a file to MVS's reader. This is important because MVS over here... Um, and... and uh, there we go. Reader one skipping for job card. It was sitting there waiting for a job to come in. Hmm. So what I did was I sent it a card and it's not waiting anymore. It says is, reader one is drained. This message, all available functions complete, is just who's saying, okay, give me something to do. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to tell it to go away. And then it's going to think about it some more. Just who termination complete, just who ended. At this point, the operating system can't do anything. Because JES2 is the component responsible for sucking in work and dispatching it. Okay. So the only thing I can, if I wanted to, I could start JES2 again. But I, no, I'm going to. Hit, this command is halt end of day. <laughs> and that flushes all the final buffers. And it says halt end of day successful. If I could type. Um, I just told it to log off of VM. So the, the MVS virtual machine is now stopped. It is no longer in the system. It's dead, pining for the yards. <laughs> and if you come over here, you say drop from MVS. And if you actually hit enter here, you're back to a VM login screen. Oh, yeah. So I could log on as uh, Maint, the CMS 
version of root and do maintenance kinds of things. But I'm not. I'm going to come over, come back over here and get rid of that. And go back to the input area and tell it I'm going to shut down VM. Yes, this system shut down complete. So now I can get rid of these because they're no longer useful. Yeah, they were just terminals to the yeah. running thing in the background. Yeah, these are all emulated 3270 terminals. And so, so here you say it says processor zero is stopped. Yep. And what I'm going to do is hit the power switch. <laughs> Confirm power down, yes or no? Yes. And black Her Hercules exits. <laughs> <laughs> it's turtles all the way down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's awesome. It is. It, it's a remarkable achievement. There have been a lot of people put a lot of work into Hercules and making what it is today. All right. So that's Hercules. And basically what you went through, you don't even have to use it on a Raspberry Pi if you have a Linux. Well, no, you said it runs on Windows, Mac OS. And Linux. Linux, pretty much anything. And you can download this and get it running. There's a GitHub link. There's yeah, there's there's GitHub for uh, for Hercules itself. Uh, there is there are actually two different versions of it in common use. Uh, one of them is a bit more maintained, a bit more bleeding edge. The other one's intended more for more production kind of uses. Um, <laughs> Don't let IBM hear that. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the the one that I use, Hyperion, is maintained by a guy known by a guy by the name of David Trout, who is universally known as Fish. <laughs> so if you hear people in the Hercules community talk about fish, that's who they're talking about. <laughs> Small world. Yes. But, uh, yeah. No, it's really great. And it's a really great way to preserve programs that were originally designed, um, you know, for mainframes and uh, the things that run business and the things that ended up in academia and the things that, that uh, really led to, to kind of the modern world. But it's also fun that a lot of the things in the architecture planning four mainframes are some of the best practices that we have in the modern industry today yes like mythical man month was a great example but literally if you dig into this this can really help you in your career and help you with a deeper uh, you know level a deeper understanding of computer science things in general because everything old really is new again and Every and, and for example uh, today's computer uh, system administrators don't really understand the concept of production system the way a mainframer does. Um, a mainframer, you know, it, on a on today's Linux or Windows-based server systems, if it if it goes goes south, I just reboot it. No big deal. <laughs> no, and, we and, must. <laughs> and, and the mainframer will shoot you if you try that. <laughs> we must forensically figure out why this is, and it's like, oh, something's gone wrong with the stack pointer. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a bug in this thing. I will fix it forever. Or, or this fix that we applied last week from IBM has its own problem that tripped us. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's definitely the case that most people in the modern world are just, ah, just reboot it again. But you don't, like, you, everything that is mission critical is not and should not be built that way. Right. And uh, sometimes your development environment gives you the tools to not build that way. Sometimes it doesn't. But if it doesn't, uh, you know, that's a whole other set of problems. But if it does give you the tools, you should be aware of them. and be able, It shouldn't be foreign language when we say things like finite state machine. Yes. Or, you know, the, the concept of reading a system dump has value. Yeah. Oh, that's true even on Windows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> don't, t don't tell that to Microsoft. They haven't figured it out yet. I get, you can get many dump files that, which usually point to driver issues. Mm-hmm. Or then it's like you certify this is a WHQL driver, Microsoft. I, what? Come on, you got the metrics on this. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh well, it's been awesome having you. Oh yeah, and uh, if he's been looking oddly familiar this entire time, you might know him from the meme. Yes, <laughs> I I am I am known around the internet as the Tron guy, <laughs> uh, and. It, it's uh that's been a wild ride i recently did an interview with know your meme about that and uh and uh, we'll point you at that for for more that's, that, on that that's fun and exciting but legit actual I, I had i had wanted to become known for my work with hercules you know like wendell here who is known for what he does that's why i wanted to do a janitor and, with the best of them 
Instead, I'm known for what I look like in tights. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you might be known for what you look like in tights, but when you dig deeper uh, and you look at the the passion that has gone into Hercules and things like, you know, stuffing a Raspberry Pi and 122 Model M keyboard. I mean, Model M keyboards definitely overlap with my interests. Mm -hmm. And Model M keyboards and the buckling spring awesomeness definitely overlaps with a lot of... Uh, and, and you heard that as I was typing on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great sort of a keyboard and all the other stuff. But that passion is sort of what brings us all together as a community. And uh, um, the knowledge that is in... Uh, that has been poured into uh, mainframes and the software and the engineering and all of that is even more applicable today um, than ever because of cloud engineering and because of less is more in the cloud and because of serverless and mm -hmm. some of the architectural parallels. So it really is, you know... Uh, we're, we're looping back to where we started. Yeah, yeah. And, and the fact that Hercules lets you examine that to the nth degree in a real working operating environment you don't have to guess it's a little bit less uh guesswork yes. with archaeology it's like sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, we found this roman fresco we have no idea why this is the way that it is but we can actually reboot rome with this mm -hmm. yeah the and that's what drove the folks behind the three the m370 community edition uh that's what drove volker bonke and jürgen winkelmann uh, that's what drove me. I did a cookbook on how to on how to build and generate and run the OS 360 itself. The very first, well, it wasn't quite the very first, but <laughs> the the first operating system that IBM wanted you to run. <laughs> One of the very earliest. Yes. <laughs> One of the ones when they were clued into the fact that these operating system things could actually be a source of revenue on their own. And and in fact, IBM. It took IBM a while to to apply that. Yeah. They didn't actually sell an operating system for the mainframe until about 1984. I think that uh, they really took their name a little too seriously. It's like, we are international business machines. Software is secondary. Because mm -hmm. if they hadn't not taken software seriously, Microsoft probably wouldn't have been a thing. Yes. they uh, uh, IBM started selling software uh, in the early 70s. Uh, if, you, if you go back and research unbundling, uh, there was a whole big controversy about that then. And now, of course, it's the norm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, IBM wanted to be international business machines. We're not in the business of software. We want to sell yes. you the machine. The software is just the thing that makes the machine do whatever. Right. And that's the way they approached it. Yeah. And that's the way their customers approached it as well. <laughs> Don't worry. Jeff Bezos is not going to make that mistake. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's out at Amazon now. So I guess it's, I've got to make it's, it's some new guy. He's not, he's, uh, whoever the new guy is at Amazon, they're not going to make that mistake, and neither is any other cloud provider. In fact, all those cloud providers are not letting their software out at all. No. So. Al although, interestingly enough, uh, the open source community is replicating that. You can now get an open source suite that acts like AWS. Oh, yeah. Uh, S3 was the first one that I experimented with, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the open source S3 clones were really, really good. Uh, that'll have to be a video for a different day, though, yes. because I think that uh, I think that the cloud providers are about to uh, uh, sort of lose their value proposition because the APIs are getting so robust that you don't have to be wed to Amazon, but you can have Amazon type functionality on any one of a number of platforms, and that means we're going to be in a race to the bottom on hardware costs and deliverability and all that kind of thing. That'll, that'll just, be just think, you can you can run your own AWS on a stack of Raspberry Pi. <laughs> well, you could run MVS in Amazon's cloud if you really wanted to. Yes. And uh, probably even get more than 60 MIPS. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you can do that in a keyboard, it's pretty darn impressive. So. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun building this. Cool. Well, uh, thank you for joining me, and hopefully you got something out of this. And we'll see you in the comments or random places around the internet.